Yeah, so with uh, morning leading up to this, with sort of learning more and more about what the, I would say, infrastructure um, and sort of the, the piping for um, bringing these assets, bringing securities on into crypto, um, I now want to talk about actually maybe what is a use case and what Sony Futures is actually doing to bring, connect these assets that we have today uh, with what uh, is the growing um, DeFi ecosystem. Sony Futures was started in 2018 with the mission um, to change the rules of global trade. Um, and that means if you think of trade, well, there's obviously the, the, the goods and the services that move, but well, the other half of global trade, of course, is the money that moves around. And so this is um, a bit of my background, um, the background of our founding team in sort of helping businesses unlock um, their working capital, unlock their assets, sort of turning them, getting, giving them access to liquidity. And so with that, um, when uh, we initially started looking at what is blockchain as a technology and what is sort of Ethereum as an open ecosystem doing that could be beneficial for businesses around the world, the, um, the idea of the focus immediately started going towards, well, how can we allow businesses to borrow money against assets they already have um, in, in this new ecosystem? And so I wanna maybe show, talk a little bit about the motivation and the opportunity here. Um, I think sort of what we know today, um, these are maybe the two most extreme numbers I could find, but um, Google, or Google or Alphabet made headlines um, earlier this year when they issued a record bond at 0.53% uh, uh, interest rate for $10 billion, and they sold it. Um, this is in contrast to the like average um, uh, cost of capital for a short-term um, uh, SME loan that is usually like north of uh, 15%, including transaction fees and, and all that. And so while well, you look at these two numbers and you think, well, okay, well, maybe Google's probably one of the most valued companies in the world and they've got um, a stable revenue and all that, and maybe that explains it. But then you sort of go a bit, dig a bit deeper and you look at, well, what is actually the risk of these smaller businesses? What is really the the risk that is in this transaction where these businesses pay this 15% uh, rate that's around 30%, 30 times higher than, than what Google is paying. And you look at one stat that is, what is the rate of default across the board of small businesses, and that is actually only 2% in the US. Um, and so the numbers I'm referring to here are uh, for uh, US uh, businesses. And so then you start to think, well, hmm, okay, so if these businesses only really default at a rate of 2% per year or less, Really, there shouldn't be such a huge discrepancy. Um, and the most obvious, well, explanation here is, well, there's a, these businesses that have much smaller transactions, uh, and there's a lot less of a transparent market, right? Google is in a um, seller's market. Everyone is looking for yield. Uh, there is no yield to be had really anywhere, and that's why Google can sell even a half percent uh, note. Um, whereas for small businesses, the, the situation is reversed. Um, they are obviously very dependent on their banks. There's no, mark, no public market for that. The public um, capital market, the, the, the debt market, is not accessible to them. And so now um, bringing crypto and blockchain into the picture here, um, well, what, what sort of started with, with Bitcoin and then maybe became even clearer in 2017 in the ICO craze was that with... Um, with this technology now, we suddenly have the opportunity to build something that does not have any barrier of entries, that doesn't have this like high cost of entry that uh, IPOs have today, bond issuance has today, investment banks that only talk to you if you're worth um, uh, multiples of what uh, these, these smaller um, borrowers are. And so um, out of that um, 2017 ICO boom, um, started developing the what we call the DeFi ecosystem, the decentralized finance ecosystem, and sort of in parallel to the financial infrastructure that we have here in the traditional world, in the real world, we have a, a financial system starting to develop that 100% relies on code, uh, where we see more and more both a combination of new products uh, and a combination of, or sort of new products and um, existing products being reinvented, being brought over into this world. And so as an example, well, stable coins, 
there is sort of a way for have, to having a stable store of value. We have money markets that allow you to algorithmically uh, distribute uh, yield across different, in, different liquidity providers and, and, and sort of make this accessible to different borrowers. For example, Aave and Compound are, um, are examples here. Uh, you have exchange, decentralized exchanges and the list goes on, right? Um, what we don't have yet today is a way for the vast majority of, um, of the world to actually access it. And I think this is where the opportunity is, is with, um, with DeFi. It's if we can start um, taking all of this technical innovation that has led to crypto projects today having a system that doesn't have these barrier of entries, how can we use those to uh, make this accessible to uh, businesses and um, sort of traditional assets? Um, and this is obviously an enormous opportunity. Um, it's it, what, where DeFi is today, uh, it's, it's exploded. We've seen the crypto growing and growing, and within that, DeFi probably growing the fastest of sort of all these different trends. And um, yet, there's still, I think, about like less than 2,000 times uh, small, about 2,000 times smaller than uh, what a JP Morgan has under custody, right? So um, all of this. Um, what we're doing here is still peanuts compared to um, if we're starting to think of unlocking some of this to the, the masses that um, we want to actually ultimately make this available to. Um, one interesting thing, and I think for me a big uh, vision and, and, or a big part of this vision as well, if you think of, and I'm, quote, I'm, uh, I'm quoting here Rune Christensen, he's the CEO and I guess co-founder of uh, MakerDAO, uh, which is a collateral backed stablecoin um, is that you have these products that truly really build something that doesn't exist today. MakerDAO is a lending protocol that doesn't have a cost of capital. They don't have investors that provide them liquidity. They make their own liquidity by minting their own stablecoin. Well, what does that mean? It actually means that um, if you're able to borrow from Maker, you're not going through five different banks and intermediaries to, the, uh, to your counterparty, you actually, you're almost like getting money that is directly printed from, uh, by, the, by the central bank, right? And so this, is, um, this can change, the, 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 this can change the, uh, how, how the, the, the financial systems, how yield, how uh, sort of these, these products work today. Um, so how do we actually, um, solve this? How do we allow these businesses to access this DeFi ecosystem? Well, we need a way to scale this, right? Like a business, like talking about mortgages, about inventory, about invoices, those are all very hard to price, very liquid, very um, sort of unique assets. They are um, by, in essence, non-fungible, right? A different invoice has a, has a, a, a due date, a, a, a counterparty with a specific credit risk, uh, a, a, uh, an amount, and you can't really like sell invoices and trade invoices one for the other. So what you need to do is you need to build in this layer of scalability, and that is something that's really nothing new. Um, credit funds have been doing this for a while. They bundle up different loans and they sell then a security that represents a share in these loans. And so Centrifuge is building what we call Tin Lake, which is a uh, set of smart contracts that allow what we, what we call asset originators to create these pools of, um, of invoices, of houses, of uh, farmland, whatever you can think of tokenize the individual assets, put them together, issue a security against it, an ERC-20 token, that can then be used both with uh, DeFi lending protocols, but also with, um, with investors that just want to buy these tokens outright and sort of want direct exposure to them. So the process is sort of, um, has these two, two parties. We have obviously the investors on one side and we have what we call the asset originators on the other side. We talk about asset originators and borrowers because, um, well, I ultimately dream of um, people natively using crypto uh, on their phones in their day-to-day -day business, um, paying for my Coke or whatever. I would, um, 
I think today say that unless you're a software engineer, you're not really able to do that because of the complexity that we're still quite far away from actually getting there. So asset originators for us are the sort of intermediate that is necessary, that is taking these existing businesses and, allow, and giving them the fiat that they want, and in turn interacting with the blockchain and accessing the liquidity, turning that liquidity into a fiat and vice versa, turning the assets into something that the DeFi ecosystem can use. So these asset originators uh, take individual assets, turn these into non-fungible tokens, which each represent a legal asset, an invoice, for example, and then put those into a tin lake pool. A uh, tin lake pool then issues an ERC-20 token that uh, is an interest-bearing uh, token that you can then buy and uh, hold to, get, uh, to earn your interest on that portfolio of loans. So with, I think, sort of the idea of Bitcoin um, and how it was founded most likely was in very, in very large parts motivated by this radical transparency, this control that, that um, cryptocurrencies give everyone, not just certain entities over the system. And so sort of thinking of, well, how do we bring these assets into DeFi? We haven't really achieved much if all that we're doing is we're taking some asset that exists today, uh, with this one piece of paper claiming that now this piece of code is suddenly worth what it, this, or suddenly represents this asset, and there's not really a, a way actually to follow through all of this, um, to, so to, to, to verify all of this information on chain. And so from, um, f from a DeFi perspective, what we want is we want a process that is secure, trustless, and um, can be verified by anyone, right? So we want to avoid this black box that is, uh, the asset originator does something, the investors are ultimately expected to trust that the asset originators do what they're doing and that these assets actually do exist in the real world and that the legal paperwork was properly filed, that there is a, uh, that there is a valid claim against them. Um, because otherwise you just have another um, exit scam or a fraud on your hands. Um, so we solved this problem actually by introducing a third entity into this system that we have where we have the asset originators, which are basically the issuers. Um, they sell these tokens to investors, but for uh, these tokens actually to be worth something, the investors need to do their due diligence on the issuers, they need to trust them, but with, with underwriters we can actually change this. We can create a third entity of users that, um, that take on this work and do this work for both the asset originators and the investors. And so when we think of credit underwriters in today's world, um, their business model is usually, uh, well, maybe a, a ratings agency is just getting paid a flat fee for put whatever stamp they're putting on on, the, on your bond. Uh, maybe a data modeling company like a, a Clearview, for example, in the US, a, a real estate company, they're getting paid for uh, just sort of giving a, an estimate on, a, on the, the value of a house. All of these things, they don't really come with having something at stake. Like they don't incentivize underwriters to actually do something. And what we have with, with sort of encoding this entire credit fund that we're now building step by step in code is actually we have this capability to not just take our existing process that was developed over the years, mostly based on paper contracts that uh, many, probably like 50 years ago, were still typed on typewriters. Actually, today we have a system that works every second in code, where the scale and the sort of control of all of this is obviously radically different. And so in the same way, we think actually, well, we don't want underwriters to just put their stamp of approval on this uh, on the security and say this is a AAA rated or a B rated. We want to take underwriters and turn them into a, a part of this ecosystem where they put something up and they have something at stake to um, sort of underwrite these individual assets. So um, I want to use an example um, of one of our users, Console Freight. They are um, a freight for they are a freight forwarding platform. They allow um, freight forwarders sort of to manage their transactions, share go share cargo, share orders pool um, and sort of just transact with their buyers. They have a network of freight forwarders that are using their product today to, um, to just ship goods around the world. They have been using uh, Cernifuge from actually day one that we went live on mainnet and started out financing their 
uh, sort of offering a product on top of their sort of existing product, offering the access to capital for the invoices that they see in their system. And so through Console Freight, you could consider Console Freight a very early um, fintech company. They have been um, sort of looking at, they have a, a, a customer relationship, these shippers that use their product, they have, these shippers need access to capital, and so now they're thinking of, okay, how do we provide them this access to capital, not with the bank, but with, um, well, using liquidity that exists on chain. And so they're going through this process of tokenizing these individual invoices, getting DAI um, from investors, and in the future getting DAI from from MakerDAO as, a, as sort of the um, lender. And they are um, doing that um, sort of financing $5,000 um, assets on average um, invoices, sort of roughly r turning over these assets on a, on a 60 day basis. Um, so they're building this pool. And uh, what, what we do actually, the first thing to sort of create um, a relatively safe and stable asset is that we say we're going to um, take this credit fund and we're doing something that's actually very boring, fairly common. We uh, created we create a true trans structure, so we have both debt and equity. Uh, in this example, well, we actually have two tokens. One of them represents uh, equity, and one of them represents debt. Uh, we call those tokens tin and drop. Uh, drop tokens are the senior tranche; they're fixed interest um, and stable asset protected by the junior tranche, which is the leveraged uh, first loss tranche. And so this junior tranche is actually um, today primarily bought by the asset originator and sort of investors that do their, do a very thorough due diligence, are very knowledgeable of this space, take, have, the, have, the demand, have the desire to, um, to take a, um, this position, to ha take this high-risk position. And actually, when you think about it a little bit, well, actually, they would be the ideal underwriters that could decide, well, whether one NFT, one individual invoice should be um, allowed to be funded by this, uh, by this fund, by this pool, or whether this invoice shouldn't be, whether it's too expensive or uh, too, too cheap, possibly. Um, I see I'm a little bit short on time, but so what we do is we actually... Um, um, allow these junior investors to start underwriting the pool, and we do that by um, allowing them to vote with their tokens on which assets get added to the pool. And so that changes this thing that is used to look like mostly an equity share in a, in a credit fund to actually now an active work token that, you, that these underwriters use as a way to um, Signify, uh, signal their confidence on assets, and then get rewarded if uh, these assets are, are being if these loans are being repaid. And so that is now their business model to sort of take this pool and uh, maintain sort of the the uh, maintain the security of the pool, sort of maintain that this, the the assets are correctly uh, correctly priced, um, and that the investors in the end are protected, and the asset originators are um, doing that with a good credit model. I think I'm going to skip over this slide, um, just because I'm out of time. But um, so yeah, in in brief, um, what we now have is a truly like crypto native way that we have a transparent process on chain, take from the individual asset how it's being priced, and then all the way to um, making sure that these investors can uh, receive their their return on them.